Okay, so I have a bit, bit more than one hour. I will talk about processing large rasters using tiling and parallelization. Um, and I will also touch a bit GrassGS. I am also a GrassGS user, but I tend to use it uh, just through command line. Uh, so I will show you also how you can do, directly from R, you can do uh, GrassGS uh, without even need to open the session or command line. Um, so let's see. The idea is to, I will talk a bit about the um, concept of uh, computing with large rasters and also parallelization. And I will talk about parallelization for different types of processes from reading, processing, um, doing raster computation. Uh, and then I will do two examples. One is uh, uh, global end cover data, so I'll do it in front of you. And then the other one is a DM analysis. This one is a bit more complex, so um, maybe I will jump over some uh, parts of the analysis. So the, the three Vs of uh, big data. So the big data, it's not necessarily only the data that is high in volume. It can also be a data which is difficult to import or read or organize. Uh, and it can also be a data which has high complexity. So this can be also considered big data. So you can have a data set maybe not so big, but you have like, I don't know, thousand million variables or something. Uh, the uh, the future, of course, uh, we can easily predict that that the size of the data, of all of the data, just are going to only grow, especially with the uh, Internet of Things. Uh, but also, we see it in our field, in the remote sensing field. If you look five years ago, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, you can see that there's an exponential growth of data. Um, so that's kind of unavoidable. And that's why uh, probably many of you voted for this topic, I think, when we put the topic online, then many of you voted, uh, I think it was the number one most popular topic during registrations. Um, there is a difference between managing the big data and doing the big data analytics, and typically there's a bit of, um, usually there's a bit of uh, delay. If you, the first step is to organize the big data, and once you organize it, you do uh, big data analytics, um, and if you did everything properly, then actually the the benefit of big data is to possibility to do big data analytics and to really add value to your decisions and to uh, your products. Um, I will talk about both, yeah, but uh, kind of uh, the lecture is somewhere in between, so I'm teaching you from organizing to processing big data. I started programming with big data about five, six years ago. Um, and by the way, this big data, I put quotes because it is a phrase, you know, it's not like, hey, look at this data set. Is it a big data or is it a small data? Right? There is no, it's a, it's a fuzzy term. Uh, they actually, some computer scientists, they uh, observe uh, the trends and then they put for every year, they put what is the volume and what is the complexity of data, which some of them classify as big data. And I think a few years ago, that was, I think, 40 terabytes. But this is one group. One group says, okay, if it's bigger than 40 terabytes, you have a big data. Um, I don't know, next year it will be maybe one pentabyte. So if you have less than one pentabyte, it's not a big data. But this is one group only defined it. So it's important to notice that it's a fuzzy term. but. Nevertheless, uh, I try to tell when I teach students, when I teach people, big data is something where you will immediately won't be able to host it, process it, or work with it within your uh, existing infrastructure. Okay, that's the big data. So something that it's not like, okay, send me the data. You know, it's a, it's a, you don't have the infrastructure to, to host it, process it, or manage it. And so, it, and it is really what is right, it's a different type of game uh, because you also have to program differently. It's not the same. It's not the same, you know, like, okay, let me run some aggregation function, let me do some calculus, let me import a layer. You know, it's not the same type of programming. You have to really program different in a way. You have to go around the problem and you have to plan everything you do and you have, you have to do much more computer science and, uh, and you have to do much more planning. If you make uh, mistakes, they can be very expensive. It will be like a planning. You know, if you plan to transport two people from here to the Prague Center, okay, 
this could be a small data problem. You have two people and maybe the car got broken, you call a taxi and then you go. But now if I give you 10,000 people and you have to transfer them to the park center. So if you make a little mistake, you can do everything you get like, you know, I don't know, 200 buses and, and you, you, you have the best company and blah, blah, blah. But you forget what little thing, you forget that the parking for buses cannot host 100% of the buses. Okay? And you can have then serious problem because the whole thing fails. So it's a, you have to be much more careful. So one of the things I did by programming uh, tiling and parallelization was these soil grids um, uh, maps. And so they're global grid at soil information. And we used machine learning and we predicted in 3D, so in true depth. And, uh, and this was, a, I noticed that this was a task where I had to really change how I program and we had to also invest in some infrastructure and it was, on the end, it was a one month of computing. This was a one month of computing project. We didn't have a really big budget, okay, but we had decent budget and still without budget, spending maybe 1,000 or 2,000 euros per month on computing and storage. It took us one month of computing. And then I did a similar thing also for Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, with just uh, focusing on, on uh, micronutrients and nutrients. Uh, and there I did also some cluster analysis and uh, we built up some models to predict crop yields. So I, I think lots of, th this paper was lots of brainstorming and testing. Uh, but again, I had to do it also through parallelization, tiling, and this thing took maybe maybe one week of, of computing. So it was much less than the world, but it was still still a, a weeks of computing. This one also, my uh, my PhD student, uh, Milan Kilibarda, he actually uh, started, uh, even before me, uh, looking at tiling and how do you do tiling and um, how can you, um, in R, how can you compute with big rasters? And then later on, I, I saw what he was doing, and then I said, okay, let me try to put that in functions. So I made R functions to do tiling and parallelization. Um, and now I do projects. I do constantly projects. So people ask me something, a very high resolution global data, and I can handle that now. You know, I don't need to go and say, oh, well, I need to go use Google Earth Engine. I have my own Google Earth Engine now. I mean, of course, now it's not comparable, but I can do in the same direction. The, I can do uh, programming and computing uh, and make generate uh, uh, global data sets at very high resolution. And so that's the last paper we had on mapping a global mangrove forest soil carbon, and that was a 30 meter resolution. It was also about one week of computing to process everything. Actually, now it's much faster because global carbons, global mangroves are not huge area. Now, we do, when I do proper parallelization on a good server, it's done in, actually in one day. In one day, this type of project. I did also the global uh, potential natural vegetation mapping, and I'm going to talk about it tomorrow, but from a different aspect. I will just focus on mapping uh, species distributions and uh, classifying biomes and mapping uh, three, four species. Uh, but uh, just to mention it, that this paper was also made by using my uh, functions and tiling and parallelization. So there are three options when you want to do uh, uh, processing big data. One option is three general options. One is to uh, directly use a software that can uh, cope with that. Uh, then the second option is that you make your own functions. And then the third one is that you uh, use an uh, infrastructure so you don't you don't run any processing within your system, you do all the processing outside. The, the third system is, of course, Google Earth Engine, okay? Or, or systems like this. And so there are, two, uh, there are three options, and uh, which one did I pick? Which one am I teaching now? I'll be teaching number two, but I also will show you number one some options, so which is the software that allows you to do direct parallelization so that you can scale up, so you can go from little data set to big data set. So I will be teaching about one and two. I won't be teaching about three at all. But my wish is that you all become capable of doing number two. Okay, that's really empowering people to think about uh, big data infrastructure and big data analytics. 
So yes, it is also very rewarding. Of course, when you make something on your own, you feel like you're more in control and you feel like um, you improved and you feel like you can maybe extend it. Uh, so it's absolutely, I support you to do number two. Um, I had many problems doing in these five years, computing, doing parallelization. Uh, many, many problems I had nights when I would wake up because I set up a server, I had to deliver something and it's a few days of computing and something will happen and then the server sends me an email or I see that the server stopped computing and there's a little bug in the code. And my wife didn't like that, I will go get up in the night because I lose otherwise maybe eight hours. You know, if it's at midnight, then I will be back at work at nine. So I lost nine hours because if we pay uh, servers to do computing, many companies charge you per, per, night, uh, per month so if you pay one month of computing and if you mess up something, then the money is gone and you didn't finish your project. So I had uh, many, many stress with that. Um, I also crashed, I crashed servers. I, I, I made mistakes, just a little line of code and this little line of code will suffocate the server or will send the server to infinite loop uh, and the server will run out of space and then you wouldn't be able to connect to server anymore because it's running all the cores and uh, once I think I, would, I managed to mess it up so much that I, the only thing I could do is a clean install, okay, of the whole system. Uh, I also noticed some people, they will take some machine learning, which can be, as, as you have a little data set with 200 points, and you do some machine learning, and you do carrot package, it's fine, no problem. It takes some computing time. But then you go from two, 200 points, you go to 10,000 points. And what happens is that the uh, computing time can go exponentially up. And some people are not aware. And I saw some people, they will send some um, um, machine learning method and they will just left it hanging. And I will ask them, what are you doing? I said, well, I, I'm trying to fit this model. Well, when did you run it? I said, two days ago. And then I tell people, no, you don't, do, don't ever do that because you have no idea what's going on behind. You have no idea how much time will it take. I mean, it could take a million years, okay? So never uh, ever send something to compute without really understanding what you're doing, okay? But, and that, that you see, as soon as you go to, from small data to some big data, for example, the spatial prediction competition game, which is six million rows, you know, as soon as you go to such a big data set, you notice that, yeah, this is, I have to be very careful. I cannot just go now and make some code and send it because I have no idea what's going to happen when it's going to finish. And that's the stuff you have to understand. This is basic computer science. And this is basic computer science engineering. So computer science engineering is means if you have six million records, then you take a 1% subsample, random subsample. You make it very small. You take like 2,000 points. And then for these 2,000 points, then you fit a simple model. And then you see how much time it takes. It takes two seconds. Then you take a bit more complicated model, and then you fit and you say, okay, now it takes 20 seconds. And then you go from this little 2,000, you, you double, you go with 4,000. And then you say, okay, now it takes one and a half minute. And if you do it three times, increasing the size, you can already fit a little function, which will tell you what would be estimated computing time if you fit all six million points. And this is called computer science engineering. Okay, so you know how to plan, how to do the processing. You don't go just take the six million points and say, oh, I follow this course, I'm following what they said. It, you know, I'm trying to use the techniques and my computer is sweating and I'm not getting anything, right? Because you haven't planned. Because you don't know what you're doing. You, you, think you, you think in charge, you go to a course one week or something, you see some new package and you think you know Kung Fu now. Right? You go home and say, oh, yeah, I saw this. I can do machine learning. I'm a machine learning expert now. Right? And then machine learning is like a machine gun. You can really hurt yourself. And so that's why it's important to think really what's going on behind and to plan. And to plan both from uh, uh, aspect of statistics to understand what, what am I fitting here, how I'm predicting, what's the, what am I using here, what kind of model is it? And also in the sense of computing. I'm computing, what am I computing, how long is going to take, uh, am I generating noise, am I generating the artifacts. 
So this is all things that can go wrong. So once you start programming a bit and once it gets, once you get a bit better coder, then this is my favorite screen. This is all the cores are running, 100%. My RAM is didn't, I'm not falling out from the RAM, so I still have a, enough RAM. And I can follow up on my computer. I can follow up files that are slowly coming up. Because when I do tiling, I compute in memory, and then I write temporary files. And then I see everything is fine. And this is called production. Okay, once you, once you optimize everything, once you solve the problem, then you go into production. Then I know what I'm doing, now it's just the production. Now it's just to get that production finished and fix little problems. Um, and so one of my big tips to you is to uh, separate development from production. So some people, it's difficult to say, they say well, how do you mean development from production? So the development is what I told you, is that you just think like, what is the optimal method? What's the workflow? You don't think about the, the big uh, data volumes. You don't think about how do I do that with six million records. So development is you just think what is the right method. This is the type of data. This is the type of problem. What is the most uh, reasonable, most robust workflow to go from point A to point B? And this is called development. Once you're done with the development, then you go, okay, now I want to bring that modeling. I want to make it perfect. I want to optimize it. I want to make it run on all data, achieving the best accuracy, being the fastest possible. And this is called optimization. Optimization, and then if you do finish optimization, then you do production. So these are the two main processes. So I'm going to show you that with the real data, how this really works. So lesson, the lesson that I learned. So plan carefully, number one. And that's the thing I was explaining so far, more or less. Um, invest in hardware and storage. If you're going to do, if you want to do projects like projects I'm doing, uh, uh, data sets with billions of pixels, um, you know, doing some computing for whole world, or doing whole of Germany at like 10 meter resolution, okay? If you want to do projects like this, eventually you cannot do it on your laptop. Even if you do, uh, perfect development and perfect optimization. Eventually, you will still need to invest some money and get some hardware. Whether it's a hardware in your office or it's a hardware somewhere in some basement somewhere, it doesn't matter. But you have to plan that you will need to invest some money. So if you want to do something more ambitious, you, need to in, uh, you will eventually need to invest some money. I'm not talking about a lot of money, but I'm talking about one month of like high-performance computing at Amazon, will be one or two thousand euros, okay, to do type of projects I do. This is the, the average uh, price I will get. Um, implement full parallelization to maximum. So, the, as I said, the coding, when you work with big data, it's a bit different coding. You have to invest more time to make all you can to optimize, okay? When you do just a little data sets, you can spend very little time or no time to optimize. You just follow, you say, this is my workflow. I don't clean up, I don't optimize. It works for me. I get from point A to point B, and I'm happy. But when you come with the big data, most likely it's not going to work. So you have to spend much more time. You have to plan in your time that you're going to spend 50% of your time doing optimization, okay? In my company, what we do, what we sell, we sell the services optimization. We take somebody's system and we say, we can make it two times faster. We can increase the accuracy. Okay, we can, we can deliver data faster. That's what we do, that's what we, my company does. That's the service we offer. Um, and then the last thing is make scalable code. What does it mean, scalable code? So, so if you make a, a function, let's say you make a, just a function to do something, and if you, if you program in a scalable way, then this function you can run in a cloud, you can run it on a laptop, and you can run it on a cluster. It doesn't matter. This function should recognize the, the environment it has. So inside the function, you have to make functions that will query local hardware. And then based on that hardware, we'll decide how, they're going to do, how it's going to do computing. That's, that's called scalable programming. One very simple uh, case of scalable programming is 
when you do parallelization. I used to do parallelization where I would specify number of cores by hand. I would say use 24 cores, okay? This program is not scalable because if I pass that code to some other server which has more cores, then I cannot, then it is not going to run it in an optimal way. So how do I do it? I use a parallel package function which finds out how many cores are available and then I use 100% of the cores. And this is called, yeah, scalable programming. So you do inside the functions, you make functions that will query your hardware and will query uh, properties of your system and that's based on these properties will decide how it's going to compute. Okay? Uh, Google Earth Engine. So this is one uh, place where many, many young people went and it's really a growing community. And I also, I went to a, a training course in Vienna during the EGU, uh, Google Earth Engine, and of course it's a, ve it's a very serious project. Uh, I don't know how many Google, Google infrastructure, I mean, it's like a, we are really David versus Goliath there, uh, so I don't know how, with how many servers they work, but I, I bet you it's like tens of thousands of servers, okay? So there's really massive infrastructure, and they also have some of the best programmers, one of the best developers, so when they, you get this team sits down and they just, okay, let's make something where we can do raster computing. And then they made this Google Earth Engine and so it's also a place where you want to go, if you want to go and do your work. Uh, at the moment I don't use it. I, I don't use it but I might change. Okay, I don't use it because I'm making my own functions and I like to invest the time in teaching myself how to do it properly. Not just going on a somebody else's system and just blindly using some function without knowing really how does it work, okay? So that's why I like to teach myself. But it doesn't mean that I don't recommend that you use it. I do recommend that you use Google Earth Engine. Somebody's using Google Earth Engine? Programming Google Earth Engine? Yes, a bit, two. Actually, Edzer is going to talk. Edzer has a project with Google, so they are together on a project. It's called uh, uh, Open Earth Observation and they would like to make more bridges between R and Google Earth Engine. So I'm looking forward to that. They are, of course, as I said, they're brilliant programmers and it's a fantastic things that Google has made for people, so don't get me wrong. Um, uh, but I like to teach you now how to do it in R and how to do it on your own. That's what I want to teach you. Uh, okay, so the, when you do a, a processing big data, uh, basically what I discover, if you really want to have it done, as fast as possible. So like, I have this server. Let me see. So this is my server, this is in my office actually. I need to connect back. Uh, so I just connected to my server. And this is a Ferrari, right? It has 64 cores and it has 400 gigabyte RAM. Okay? So, so very happy with that. But once you get a Ferrari in your room, once you have a Ferrari in your room, then you don't drive like a bicycle. So everything you want, everything you're doing, it has to run all the cores. So if you read the data, you, you have to read it in parallel. If you want to uh, organize the data, you organize in parallel. If you want to subset the data, you subset in parallel. If you want to predict, uh, you, if you want to fit a model in parallel. So everything possible, you parallelize. Everything can parallelize, it has to be parallelized. The, when you get a Ferrari, and when you say I'm going to use a Ferrari from today till in one week, I can check, I can check on my log of my server and I can see how much I use the hardware. If my hardware usage drops below 10%, then I'm just a rich guy with a Ferrari in a garage. Okay? You want to have a Ferrari that really sweats. If you bought a Ferrari, you drive it like a lunatic. Not like a lunatic, okay, maybe. But, uh, but you want to use it. So you have to program, so you parallelize everything. So here's the uh, functions when you read the data. What I realized, uh, when you have a big CSV file or something, the best one is to use data table. Uh, the function is called fred. It's about 100 times faster than read CSV. Or even more, exponentially faster as the size grows. Uh, when you read the shape files, I used to use the read uh, read OGR, but if you compare the SF and read OGR, it's also much, much faster. By the way, all these things I'm talking about, the embedded links. So you see, this link will take you to that page that explains that, and this thing will take you to a page which shows the 
a systematic comparison of how you read big tables into R. Okay, and these people find that look, yes. Sorry? Uh, the, no, SF doesn't run in parallel. Data table, also not, unfortunately, but it's somehow very fast. Um, and then this one, this one you can parallelize, yes. The raster, reading of rasters. So this is a combination of a raster package, uh, do parallel and for each. And you can combine that to read rasters in parallel. Okay, so you're not going to just go, hey, raster and then file. And you say, no, no, raster with this function, and then I read it. Yes, you could do with the shape files, but if it's a single big shape file, yes. I will show you with the raster data how you parallelize. Uh, when you use GDAL, uh, GDAL, it's like a backbone of most of geographical analysis. Um, it's a like a fundamental software which allows you to get the data and also to compile the data, but it also has uh, utilities. One of the utilities, very famous, GDAL warp. Are you aware of GDAL warp? So it's a fantastic function. It's a, it will do reprojection, resampling, subsetting, uh, conversion, um, what else? Interpolation. So it will do like 60 things you will get in a, like some commercial GIS software. They said, this is what we sell you. This is the things you get in GDAL with a single command, okay? Just GDAL warp. And uh, so when you start using GDAL warp and it's on a big data, you have to say that you want to create a big GeoTIFF, otherwise it's going to fail. Uh, you have to give it some cache. This is two gigabyte. Uh, and you have to uh, compress the data because otherwise it takes too much space. And you can also specify that you want to use all threads. So when I write GDAL on this big Ferrari, I always use this thing in yellow when I work with the bigger geotiffs, okay? So this is something I, it took me years to figure out how is the right way to fine tune it, you know, because I did a lot of GDAL warp. I do GDAL warp on a daily basis. And then I realized this is the way. Uh, so I, I showed you this function to read from a raster package, you can parallelize it. I don't use raster package for this. I use only the RGDAL package. I think RGDAL package has everything you need to do uh, with the parallelization to read big data, okay? So I made my own functions, which are the yellow functions. Uh, so I made the function uh, get spatial tiles. So I will uh, uh, ping to uh, 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 some geotiff so I don't read it into R, I just go and I say, give me the GDAL info. In GDAL info, it does the same thing as the raster function. It will just get a definition of a grid system, projection system, and definition of the, of the size of the data, et cetera. But it's not going to load the data into memory. And once I get the definition, then uh, this is an object of type, some GDAL object. And then for that object, I made a S4 class function, which is get spatial tiles, and that this will calculate a tiling system. This will calculate tiling system of that object, and I can do it, uh, I can do it just to get the tabular data, so the tiles is the tabular data, but I can also produce polygons. Often you need both, because you want to visualize. You want to see the, where the tiles are. When you have a problem with some tile, you want to know where is that tile, where geographical is that tile. And then I run that, um, and then I uh, create that tiling system, and that looks something like, like I will show you later in the, uh, with the example. Uh, when you read R objects, so any R data, you know, you do the save image, right? You do the save image. You have a session, save image. What if image is 20 gigabytes? <laughs> I have images, uh, 20 gigabytes. For the spatial prediction competition game, I have a 25 gigabyte image when I load all the data. So what do you do, save image? Are you going to save image and then wait for 20 minutes? So you, you can also write all the objects, you can write them in parallel. So these are the functions. They will run on a, a Linux. I don't know about the Windows system. Probably or should also work. But on a Unix system, you can parallelize reading and writing of data in parallel. Okay, so I don't use the function 
uh, read RDS, but I use a function read RDS GZ. And it does work. It's, I tested, of course, if I have an object, five gigabyte, I read it in two seconds on the Ferrari. It's no problem. Uh, there are some also software which is made brilliantly, and one of them, one of my favorite is the Saga GS. And I didn't know about maybe five to ten years ago, I didn't know whether I can really use Saga GS on a big data. And bingo, surprise. So uh, Olaf Kondrad and his colleague, they really did very good work, and they programmed in C++, and they made it very scalable. So when you do some computing in Saga GS, if you put it on a big infrastructure, it will just automatically recognize uh, how many cores it has, and it will use all the, all the capacity. So a lot of global processing, global data I do, I use Saga GS. And of course, it's the easiest case because I don't have to make my own function. If I need to calculate slope map, if I need to do some um, vector to raster conversion, I can just use Saga GS. The only problem is that you have to use this Saga raster, um, Saga raster format, which is a bit primitive binary format. It has no compression. Uh, and also, it's like for a long time, there was no GDAL uh, supported driver. And then I went, uh, one year I went to visit uh, Roger Bivand in Norway, and, and I pushed him, please, can you do something? And then he wrote the driver, if you can believe, he wrote the driver for GDAL for Saga GS. Before that, you couldn't get uh, a raster maps from Saga GS directly. You had to use some Saga module to export to GeoTIFF. Um, so if you, if you see in the Saga GS command line, there is option, it's called minus C, and this is the number of cores. If you don't specify it, it will automatically take all the cores. So when I put Saga GS on this Ferrari, in one line I go and I do big, big data processing. Okay, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to say how many cores I have and I don't want to parallel, it's automatic. So congratulations really to the Saga GS team. Now for Graph GS it's a bit more complicated. This is what Marcus Netteler wrote me. Uh, it's a bit more complicated because most of the functions are not parallel automatically, but what you can do, you can make scripts and you can program, it's so much more flexible to program the Saga GS. And so you can make your own scripts and then you can run these scripts in parallel. I will show, if I have time, I will show the, the Geomorphon, it's a, a DM classification algorithm, which will run only one core, but it's relatively fast. So on one side, the Grass GS, many things is not automatically parallel, but the, the program is done very well and it runs really somehow very fast, somehow. Okay, this is example. We have uh, land cover images of the world and we have two periods and these are global land cover images. Uh, one image is something like 1.4 gigabytes or something. Um, so, so they're big images. If you do that image, you read GDAL, that image in R, what will happen? So let's see, here's the image. So you see they're like three gigabytes actually to download. So if you do read GDAL, that image into R, you take your laptop and you say, okay, let me read that image. I need to calculate the difference between two land cover images. So what will happen? it will crash, it will run out of RAM, plus just reading it, it will read it with a one core, and it, reading it could take two hours or more, even if you have one terabyte RAM. It will take a lot of time to read, and most likely it will crash your system. So obviously you cannot do that, and that's why people go and use Google Earth Engine or use whatever they can find because they do want to process at finer resolution. We want to use things at finer resolution. Also, in temporal, we want to work with hours and minutes. And also, we want to use with multiple bands. We want to use multiple. So we want the higher detail. We want the higher precision. And this has a cost. The cost is you have to learn how to uh, program in a different way. So, uh, so I estimated to calculate the, so to calculate this difference at uh, 300 meter resolution, 
basically this this is this computer uh, science engineering is that I estimate now how much CPU hours will take me this is what this is like the key number I need to know how many CPU hours and I came to about 80 CPU hours okay that's about about four days right so I don't have time to wait for four days so I go into infrastructure where I have a 80 cores or 60 cores and I get it done in one hour Okay, and that's why I told you you have to balance sometimes, you do have to buy some hardware, um, but you have to know, okay, I want to do this, and it's unavoidable, I cannot get it faster than 80 CPU hours. Okay, once I go, I say, okay, this is the fastest, maybe I can get it 70, but this is it, this is the number. Then I have to just plan the hardware. Then I just have to get the hardware, okay, I get 64 cores, this computer, and I'm done, a bit more than an hour. And that's awesome, right? You calculate with the billions of pixels, and you get in one hour, you get the results. You know, and that's not very different from Google Earth Engine. Because in Google Earth Engine, if you want to calculate global, um, so you, you want to spend 80 CPU hours, 100 or 200 CPU hours, you know, it's also, you're not going to get it in a second. It also might take a few minutes. And then eventually, if it takes more than 10 minutes, what happens with the Google Earth Engine? It was those of you who use it. If you have a process that will take more than 10 minutes, what happens? Is it 10 minutes or some, there's some threshold time? Right, so, so on their infrastructure, if it takes more than some time, then they say, no, you can't compute it, I think. That's the last thing I heard. I don't know, I, I'm not a frequent user of Google Earth Engine, but I bet you that you cannot go and say, now I want to do some heavy computing on, on Google infrastructure. I'm going to compute for, for two days. It's not going to happen. So you have to reprogram then, so it matches within your budget, and they have a budget for uh, free users or for the for the users which are you know they don't they don't pay to use the Google Earth Engine they have a fixed budget and this budget they measure in CPU hours. Okay, so this is an image globally 130,000 by 65,000 pixels. So it's pretty big. I think what is this? Uh, how many zeros? That's 8 billion, 8.4 billion. Okay, so it's a pretty serious thing to compute with this, imagine 8.4 billion pixels. And I can compute on my Ferrari, I can compute this in one hour. And how did I do that? So first I, um, I prepare the tiling system, then I prepare a function to process each tile, then I check that these functions work, and they work on extreme cases when I have all missing pixels or I have a, a all pixels are the same. Um, and then once I'm done checking everything, and once I know how many CPU hours will take, then I just run it. Once I'm done, I write into all the files as a temporary output, I run them into one folder, and these are just the tiles. And once I have the tiles, then I create a, with a, a build virtual mosaic, I create a virtual mosaic, and the map is finished. And then I can generate a geotiff. And, it, and in no moment, I loaded the whole data in R. So I have a big data, I never load it in R, I compute with it, and I finish with the big data's output, which I also never loaded in R. Okay? Uh, this server I showed you, this is a, a Intel Xeon Gold newest chips, 64 threads, it has 400 gigabyte RAM. Um, we actually, we bought that server, we discovered that it's easier to buy our own server. Uh, but it's not, we cannot do all the work with it. So we still have to pay for Amazon and OVH. But we bought this one. So, uh, so this, is, this is something I can run. That's this Ferrari I was talking about. And it's very good. It was a very good investment. I'm very happy with it, by the way. Uh, we also get, you know, when you work with uh, uh, gigabytes of data, you will get inside gigabytes of data, you get outside gigabytes. You need to store them somewhere. You're not going to be able to store them in your laptop. This is a, a NAS Synology D station. It can serve up to 50 terabytes of data simultaneously to some 10 users. So you don't have to have a data on your laptop at all. You can have all the data on that sta Synology station and you mount it on your, on your system and you di work directly on the data on the NAS. It's also a fantastic system and I don't regret any penny we spend on buying that. And it's been running now, I think, some two years without a stop. So just to give you an idea. 
Uh, this is the function. So when I make a tiling system, I make a function. Um, and this function, I can use a plier package. I can use the uh, anything I use in R. So this, this processing is then a, just a simple standard R processing. Because when I do a simple uh, one tile, then it's like a one megabyte in memory or two megabytes, you know, so it's a small data. And I can do anything in that function. Uh, and then once I get that function done, then I use a snowfall. My favorite is snowfall. It runs on Ubuntu without problem usually. Um, it's kind of, a, it's a bit more code than parallel or do, uh, do parallel. It's a bit more code, but you feel like you're more in control, okay? And so when I say you're more in control, you specify the number of cores, some automatic, you specify which are the objects you want to export to each of the threads, and then you just run the cluster apply. So this is like the same as the L apply or S apply, it's just a parallel apply. So I apply in parallel to each tile, I apply the function make LC tiles. So make land cover tiles. And then I can follow, I can follow how the tiles are made. Usually I put them in different folders. And I can see as I run it, if it runs one hour, I can just see, I do a refresh and I can see how the tiles are filled in. Uh, and then once I finish with the tiles, then I, do, I list all the files with the same pattern. So let's say if I have a thousand tiles, okay, now I want to create a, a output file, which is a single geotiff. Then I will list all the files. And then I put that files, uh, I write them into a, a virtual mosaic with the GDAL build virtual. And I just specify the text file, which has a list of all the tiles. And I can visually also check that all the tiles in the list. And then I create with the GDAL warp, I create the output file. And then I run this all threads, all CPUs, again, to have it a maximum speed. And now all the processes basically I'm running, uh, everywhere I'm using a parallel system. Okay, and so that's the fastest way for me to do in R to process. And this is the output. This was computed for whole world. So just changes in land cover from 2000, I think, to 2015. Okay, what's the, where, where did the land cover classes change? And we can zoom in then later on somewhere in Brazil, and we can see that it's quite significant changes in many areas. I don't want to say anything. I, I'm not going to get into politics of this, but yes, there are in many parts of the planet. There are, of course, in the last 20 years, there are significant changes in land use, in forest cover, in uh, wetlands cover, etc. And you can see that it's, in this case, actually 50% of pixels are changed. So 50% of landscape of this little area has changed in the last 15 years. So I'm going to show you that now with the... Uh, in our studio. And if you, if you look at the instructions for this block, you can see that there's my slides, but there is also a GitHub repository. I think all the lecturers use GitHub, right? There was no, no exception, so take it or leave it, we're all in GitHub. So if I look at this uh, GitHub repository, you can see there's a whole tutorial. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go through some of the steps here, and I, so we'll be looking at this one, which is the land cover, which has a 50 to uh, five to 20 classes. Um, and so I'm going to run slowly this thing for you. I might have to delete some files because I made the tiling function to run only if the files don't exist. So let's take a look. So this is the example with, uh, as I said, uh, with the land cover. I'm not going to use the land cover map of the whole world because it's too big. And I mean, I could probably do a, a, a everything, on, even on laptop, it will take me maybe 24 hours, uh, but there's no need for the exercise. So what I do, I took just the, 
the, what's the name of the island? The Kalimantan Island, okay, the Indonesia. And this island is only, only about 6,000 by 6,000 pixels. Okay, so I can also, to make it not too dry, I will open that island here in the QGS. So I'm looking at two files, which are the land cover maps of Indonesia for two years. So let me put the, the year 2000. So this is this uh, six by 6,000. I don't have the original legend. I have somewhere the real color legend for the land cover, but that doesn't matter. You get the idea. This is a six by 6,000, just uh, island of Kalimantan. And we want to calculate the land cover change using tiling, okay? So this is this image I just queried. I just looked at this image. How does it look? Um, then I make a function. This is the function that will calculate the difference in, in land cover. So I'll just first source it. And then I will show you what the function does. Uh, so let's see this thing. So let's take a look at this function. How does it work? So it has arguments. As arguments, I'll put a couple of arguments. Uh, one argument is the, uh, the tile. The tile sequence, that's the I. Then I also put an argument which is called a tile table. So this is a definition of tiles, okay? Uh, then I want to, uh, I put it, where do I want to write the tiles? So I put it in a directory under this directory which is called tiled. And then I have a land cover for year one and land cover for year two. These are these big tiffs. And I have some legend, legend land cover classes. So these are the arguments. So first thing I do, I create a temporary name of the output file. So this file is something below this, okay? And it will be, if I do a, a tile number is i is one. Let's take a look. So if I do i is one, then let's see, this output tiff name will be, uh, uh, so tile db, over underscore t, t this. Uh, then the next thing I do, if I do a check, if, if I have already produced that tile, then I don't run the further processing, then I skip that. So when you, sometimes you, you need to run something for a few hours, and let's say something breaks, you know, and then what you want to make a function that will automatically see, okay, these tiles are finished, so continue just running there. Okay, so I always program like that. I always make it so it does a check. Uh, so once I have this tile, tile table and, and this, I can read, with the read GDAL, I can actually read out of the whole TIFF, I can read exactly from pixel to pixel. That's a nice thing about read GDAL. You can read, you don't have to read the whole image. You can specify, I want to read a region inside uh, this uh, TIFF. And you can uh, read from beginning pixel to the end pixel. Okay, and that was what I made with this function get spatial tiles. I make function that will recognize what is the, uh, for any given spatial object, what is the definition uh, inside any spatial objects of the sub, sub area. And so once I read these two objects, then I can do simple processing. Then I convert to spatial pixels. I can make a spatial pixels data frame. I can check whether the land cover classes are the same. If they're same, then I don't do any processing. And if they're not the same, then I make a new entry in the legend. The output map out of the change of the land cover, the output map has a separate legend. So if you have a land cover class A, and if you have a, a change land cover class B, then the output class is AB. Do you understand that? It can be also BA. If the input is B, output is A, then the combination is BA. 
And we want to get all these combinations. On the end, there's like uh, 1,400 combinations. If you take 15 or 17 classes, you get a lot of possible combinations. And once I compute this change, then I do a, a plier join. So I join from this output legend what the value is, because the values have to be numbers when you write the geotiff. And then I write that geotiff with the right GDAL. Okay, so I made a little function that will run on the tiles where it will read from a geotiff, like you read from a database when you make a query, okay? And then you will run a normal processing that you will do in your R code. And so this is this uh, legend I will just show you. Uh, when I do a combined legend, I need to have, if I print out, uh, let's say, first few elements, So it looks like this. So I have a input. Input class is, let's say, value zero. Output class value zero. This is a combined legend zero, zero. 10, zero, 10, zero, right? So, but there are also reverse combinations possible. It can be zero, 10, right? That's a different class from 10, zero. So this is about 1,400 combinations. Um, and then I, I, I actually created that already, this head I was running. And now I, I will talk about this uh, tiling function. So first I will go and check whether these two land cover maps are a perfect match. When I say perfect match, I mean, you know this function raster stack? This is kind of also the fastest way to check if you have a thousand rasters, and if you want to be sure that they all stack, so they all have the, exactly the same grid definition, then you can just do this raster stack. If one of the layer is corrupt, or corrupt, let's say, doesn't have a perfect grid match, then this function is going to uh, fail. So it didn't fail, so it means, okay, that was a good check. Check is okay. Then I read this, uh, I just do a ping, and I get this object called obj, and let's take a look what it is. You did, you did that a lot of time when you use RGDAL, and a lot of time you get this output like this, right? You remember this? This is just the header. Uh, so if I look at the structure of this. So it's a bit, it's a bit abstract. Uh, um, uh, object, and actually it's a, a class, it's a GDAL object. You maybe never realize that, but you can do with the RGDAL, similar with the raster package, you can also just get the definition of that grid. So I don't load the data, I just load information about that layer. So I know the projection system, I know the file, where is it, I know that it's a geotiff, I know that it a, a, a has no data value, uh, I know that this, uh, the size, and how many pixels and rows it has. And once I know all these things, then I can say I want to have a tiling system. And now let's take a look at this tile list. What is this tile list? So if I look at that, this is when I do the, oops, uh, this one was the polygon, so I went the, went the wrong way. So let me look at the table. So when I just look at the table, basically for each tile, I know the um, beginning left corner, left corner x, y, and upper corner x, y. I know this offset in the geotiff, and I know the size of this region dimension. This is a regular tiling system, so I, I put 240 pixels. Okay, so each of these my tiles, instead of using six by 6,000 image, I will go and do processing on 240 by 240 tiles. And that makes for me, you know, for me personally, I think the, um, so I think the uh, uh, geotiff is kind of a database because you can do database operations. You can do subsetting, querying, you can, without loading things in the memory. And thanks to, mainly thanks to the uh, person who made the GDAL, or GUDAL, however you want to call it. 
So we can plot this all together. I use a TM package for this. It is a very nice package. It's, you see, it's a very elegant way. You want to say, I want to plot the tiling system for that island. So I know that island is available in the world map. And then I say, I want to plot the world map with the X slim zooming only on the island. And I want to add the tiles on top of that uh, map. And then I get this plot. So it's a very, of course, nice uh, function. And Martin did very well with that package. And for your information, Martin has already accepted to come and teach on the next uh, Geostat. Next Open Geo Hub Summer School, sorry. So, so you see that's what the plot produces. So this is this tiling system, and you can see the, um, how the tiles. My function actually allows you also to do overlap. If you want to do a tiling with overlap, you can specify overlap. Then for every pixel, you, will, you can get like 30% or 50% or more overlap. So if you need to do some buffer operations where you need to know the neighbors, then you, you, uh, you want to avoid this effect of edges, and then you can do a, a computing with overlap. If you get more interesting in this tiling function, uh, it is absolutely, uh, it's absolutely uh, transparent. So let's take a look. So in the GCIF package, uh, it's, a, it's a R function, it's called tile. And so this is, exp this is explained how I made it. It's, it's basically, I was good. I was a good student in high school, so I learned geometry. And so I figured out, okay, this is how you will do the tiling, nothing special. Uh, and then you can do with the overlap. This is adding the overlap. And then you save everything as an object back. You can make a polygon from the thanks to the SP package. Any geometry I make, I can produce my own polygons from scratch. So I produce a polygon map. Uh, and also, we can run it on vector objects. So if you want to tile a big shape files, uh, then we also run it. Uh, we can do it for, um, but thanks to the OGR to OGR. Let me see. This is for polygon map, yes. So here, the tiling will run. But then you have to use the, uh, you will have to use some processing. Yes, OGR to OGR. Uh, where is it? Here, OGR to OGR, and then, then you can also tile a huge vector. So this, this function will use both on rasters and vectors. OK. Uh, so then I can check that everything is fine. So I can actually read one tile. It's no problem to read into memory. If I read that one tile, let me look at the structure. So I get just a spatial grid data frame. You see this is 240 by 240. So it's, on the end, it's only 60,000 pixels. So it's no problem to read a, a single tile. And also that single tile, I can go in, I can visualize it. So let's take a look. And I get a little plot of some tile here. Um, I actually have the tiling system also as a shape file, I think, if I have done correctly everything. Otherwise, we can export it. No, I haven't exported the shape file. So maybe I just do it now for you so you get an idea. So I had made an object which is called a tile. So tile list. And this is spatial polygons object. And I can do a write OGR and write the tile list into a data. Uh, in this tiling system, let me just see what, what did I use for tiling um, here. Yes, I use a 0 0.5, so that's a 50 kilometer tiling system. So 50 kilometer, and that's for Indonesia. This should just work like this now, right? I don't have to put the, no, I need to do a driver also. Uh, so that will be driver is, somebody told me that now it works without specifying driver. Okay, let me see what I'm doing. No, no, no. 
polynomial, spatial polynomial is true. Our tile list should be spatial polygons, yes. So why is this saying tile list in this here? So this thing went through, and when I look at the class, yes, this is the spatial polygons. So when I do write OGR, no, so I have some problem. I think I have to specify also this layer. Uh, oh, yeah, I need a, I need a, yes, I need a data frame. I need to add a data frame. Uh, so I will have to add here. I will have to add a data frame. Um, so let's see. Have you ever done something just like this? That poll? No. Okay, no problem. I make a tile uh, poll. Uh, spatial polygons, spatial polygons data frame. So I need uh, this style list. And then I need a data frame for which I can use the uh, the tile TBL. And then I have to do say that it's not match ID, right? False. Yes, this works. And then I can do, I can write this to OGR, but now I write the polygon. So here. Okay, and now I can put that overlay here. So that must be somewhere here. So now I have this styling system um, and I want to make it transparent. And so you see, I can see now for each tile, I could also go and query. I can see, okay, what is this tile? And this will give me, this will give me exactly ID of the tile. This ID of the tile is 413. And I see all the definition of the tile for, in relation to that geotiff. You can see my tiling function also will, it starts from the lower corner. It starts from here always. So I pick it up, that's my choice. I said that you start from the lower light corner and then you fill in the tiles until the edge and you can get, sometimes it will get, if it's a non-standard size, it will have to make a little tile, irregular tile, okay? It's just I had to do that because, yes, objects are not perfectly aligned to some tiling system. So, but, but it can be done, it's not a problem, so you make you make the tiles uh, uh, that will be on the end irregular. But in the lower lower left corners, they will always be regular. Or you can have also tiles which are uh, different x, y. So they can be different x, y, and they can have a overlap. So this function, I think, is quite flexible to do any tiling. Um, so once I have that tiling system, and once I define the uh, so once I define the, uh, how I want to com uh, the function I want to compute, uh, then I can go in and run that uh, tile in, uh, in parallel. So now this is this big thing. This is the snowfall, snowfall package. Uh, so first I can load it. Uh, so in the snowfall I can uh, say uh, detect maximum amount of cores. So this is the function. So this function here will 
basically uh, query how many cores I have on my laptop. I'm, I'm a happy guy, I have eight cores on my laptop. Um, and so this is, a, that's what I say, the scalable uh, programming. So when I make a function that will query my system and will find out how they're going to compute in, so they, uh, they use 100% of hardware. Um, okay, so let's run that. I will show you how this is now exciting because uh, it will generate the data and I will be able to follow that generation of data, but I will first uh, delete all the data because I told you I made a function that only works if the data is not available. So, yes, uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to uh, run that in parallel and now I'm going to create this uh, um, tiles and let's see now if I use all of the cores. So I open my machine and uh, I put uh, for my laptop, I see, okay, I have eight cores. At the moment, they are not running, right? They are on vacation. And then I, uh, let me run that now. So I run it and now I should see, you see now it's 100 cores, 100% 100 used. And also here I can see the files pumping up. It takes a bit of time, even, even though I'm using only six by 6,000, so it does take some, some like, uh, on an eight cores, I get it in about 10, 15 seconds. But it takes a bit of time. If you have a bit slower laptop, if you run this operation, it can take a bit longer time. Uh, it has to create, I don't remember by heart, but it's something like 550 tiles, right? Uh, and it's not going to create it's not going to create a tile for every location because remember we made a function that will only work if there's a difference in land cover. If there's no difference in land cover, then I don't need a, a, a tile. You understand? I can skip that tile. So it will only produce tiles where there's a difference. So this went through and you see it will stop the cluster also. How many of you use Snowfall? How many Snowfall? Oh, this is fantastic. So, Snowfall is really important. If you do in R parallel, uh, there are some maybe more suitable parallelization packages for different processes, but the Snowfall is, is kind of the first spot you will uh, come if you want to do any parallel processing. So, so this is the Snowfall. It looks a bit scary, right? But when you think about it, uh, it's just a, a couple of combined functions where you you, you first, you, you prepare the cluster. So here you prepare the cluster by saying SF initiate, okay? The first line. And then you do, uh, you export to each of the computers, basically. You export the, the objects that you need. So only the objects that you need, of course. And then you export also the packages. You say, I'm going to use these objects and these packages, only for that operation. And then you say L apply, S apply, but it's a cluster, cluster apply. And then the LB version, LB version is this nice guys in Snowfall, what they made is that uh, this is even pushes it more. So like if you send, if you have eight cores and you said eight tiles, if one of the tiles is a bit faster and it's finished, it will fill it in with a new tile. So it's a very intelligent uh, parallelization system. So that allows you to use your cores 100% for the whole process of computing, okay? And then, then once I finish everything, um, once I finish everything, then I have to create a virtual mosaic. And so how do you do this? I, I list all the tiles uh, using the pattern search. And so I see there's a 295 files at the moment. And then I can do uh, these files, I can create a, a virtual mosaic. Um, this is what I already showed you. Uh, so I will create a virtual mosaic. It's also very fast. It's a split of a second. So, so what I have created is a, a VRT file, which is not physical file. That's what it's called virtual mosaic. This file is just a, a header. So that's in my data folder. Uh, I can look at that. Uh, virtual mosaic, so how does it look like? It's, it's basically a text file, and which has a definition of all the uh, elements of that virtual file. And these elements are written in this 
um, uh, how is it called? Uh, uh, well-known text or? Yes, well-known text is a human readable, and you can see that there are geometries. XML. Yes, this is XML, but but the, 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 for geographical data, right? So this. Uh, is that a GML VRT file? Yes. Well, I know this. This, for example, this here. This is the definition of the coordinate system in the uh, world, a uh, well-known uh, text, right? It's not approach four, but it's a well-known text. And then these are the uh, so individual elements of the mosaic. So I have a, I have basically a layer that is uh, in in GS world is virtual, so it's not doesn't physically exist. And then I can convert that virtual layers, I can convert it into a GeoTIFF using also parallelization. So I will say, use all the threads and create me now a whole uh, layer. And you see this is quite fast, um, also because I have eight cores. Um, and now I have, on my, I have on my machine here, I will have again as an output, I have a GeoTIFF which is computed in parallel from a big object to a big object, but I never loaded it whole in R. Okay? And more or less this thing I showed you, I have to stop now because we started also a bit later um, for coffee break. And all these things I now showed you, this is the basis. When, once you understand this tiling, making functions, testing, using Snowfall, building virtual stuff, all other things can be combined in this process. But the basis is to learn this principle of tiling and using a GeoTIFF as a, a kind of a, a, a big a big database from which you take little pieces and then you run processing with the little pieces. I hope this is something new for many of you. I see many interested faces. I think it's a, a new and so I, I really, I have to say from about four or five years ago, I told people that I want to run process big rasters in R, and they told me you're crazy. It's, uh, it's not a place to do any big data, and you will have RAM problems, and you will never manage to uh, crunch some big data. And I, I'm very happy that I proved them wrong, because I program basically with the raster GDAL and Snowfall and a few other uh, software, and I can run now, I run processing on terabytes of data, and it's all done in R. There are sometimes I have in R, within the tiling functions, I can have, again, some process which is a bit slower, and then I have to maybe sometimes reprogramming. But otherwise, I will run very serious processing, and I will compute, for example, land cover changes, or I will do predictions, or I will do uh, machine learning uh, with, a, with a really large stacks of uh, uh, raster images. And I will run it within a few hours sometimes. With few hours, I will produce images of whole world at 100 meter or 200 meter. Okay? And it will all be done basically through our framework. Okay, just before I go, just the last thing I wanted to show you because I promised it. Um, when you look in, the, in my tutorial, maybe I will not run it, I will just show you. Uh, so you can run processing on, on, on GrassGS on GrassGS without really starting GrassGS or thinking what is my now temporary folder or, or where does Grass put data. So you go like this. You create a temporary folder, which you can really call tempo. You can just call, give a temporary name. And then you can initiate uh, some packages and region. And then you run some processing. You run the processing. Then you delete the temporary folder you, and you remove these locks, and you remove this uh, GS, GISRC. And so basically you create the data on your computer, you compute, and then you clean up. And so this way you can use a GrassGS without ever needing to uh, start GrassGS. It's uh, for those of you who think like, okay, I would prefer to just run it from R, this will be the way to go. You don't have to delete the data. I do a cleanup just to show you that Many of you go say, like, I don't need the GrassGS copy of my data. I want to just work with the GeoTIFF, okay? If this is the case, then you want to clean up. But if you say, no, I can come back to that GrassGS copy, I want to use it, then you can uh, skip these last four lines of code. 
uh, the parallelization with the grass GS, if you will use my tiling function, you could also run that function through the grass on the tiles. It is possible, and you could so use anything from grass, which, which is fantastic GS, with now over the 600 functions, and it's a really big community. And so you could also, in theory, you could use my tiling functions to run these grass operations on the tiles. By combine, and you could run it all from R. And this package is thanks to, guess who? The R grass 7? It's mainly thanks to Roger, I think. So Roger is the guy who enabled us. So he made the RG dot, he made the R grass map tools, and he also helped make the SP package. So this is really the person why we give them a, this award because he really literally enabled us to do magic and to connect really two powerful environments that they had no bridge. Before that package, before that package, you could maybe load R into grass, but there was no way to do grass from uh, from R. And this Roger made this package, and you see how this easy is now. You adopt it to your data, you copy paste, you adopt it to your data. And you can use 600 functions from GraphGS inside our environment. OK, I'm done. Any questions? I'm sure, actually, I'm not sure what you mean. Generally, so you would like to fit a generalized linear mix models in parallel? Yes. Yes, so this thing, this is the people who made the, uh, the package to do linear mix models. You have to see with them whether this can be parallelized, yes. But yes, it is uh, for machine learning. I would like to use lots of, I see lots of uh, uh, functions and models and, um, you know, support, support vector machines, neural nets, I would like to use. But when I go to big data, I'm actually stuck with using like four or five packages because they have internal parallelization. If the package is running on one core, I cannot run it with my data. So I have to reprogram that package then. And I wonder that some packages I wonder uh, uh, um, parallelizing uh, model fitting, you know, it will require serious, serious programs for some uh, type of approaches. That's why I use a ranger. You know, ranger is my number one choice to do machine learning on big data because it's in C++ and it's fully parallelized. You just, you just initiate it and it will even tell you how much computing time it needs. So. I'm happy to know the author of Ranger. We have published two papers together now. He's a very nice guy, and I also suggested him some things that will be very useful. And uh, he finished on papers on spatial data, and he's in medicine, in medicine research, medical research. So he asked me, what is this spatial data? What is that? I, you know, some people, of course, don't know. So it was funny. I was showing him how machine learning, he runs it on deans, and uh, he's running uh, some classification algorithms on on gene sequences, and then I said, now we're going to run it on land cover, right? And he was, wow, I had no idea you could do that. So these several of the temporal modules are already prepared to run in parallel, and it's just an option in the module itself, like pros, and you set the number of cores. For the rest, you would need to go like a similar approach, I guess, like tiling and, and processing, or you could even set like different map sets so this structure has some meaning, let's say. So you can create a lot of map sets, and you just put one map set in each uh, so did core. So the hard way to do it, or, or could you could you have all of that? Sorry. Or could you have done it all at once? Uh, the same thing, yes. But the similar approach, because yeah, would mean probably to tile a bit or split into different uh, regions. Like maybe you can shift, shift the region, and that's it. You go even, to... even in R, you know, so I did it one way in R, but in R you can also do it other ways, you know. So not only you could do it in grass, so you could do it. It's not that I'm teaching you this is the only way, you know, there are many ways, but what I'm trying to teach you to do computer science engineering, to plan, to understand, okay, before I start computing or anything, I need to understand like parallelization world, what, what is, how does parallelization world works? What are the basic principles? How do I plan? So, so this is for me and please, uh, coffee break is a bit shorter. Um, please come quarter to, quarter to four.
right? Quarter to four, and then we continue. Thank you.